Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Future of Work virtual discussion. I'm your host, Todd Chirazis, and I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called AILA, which currently, currently produces content like this in a weekly series called The New Normal. We would normally host this event at one of the Google campuses in Los Angeles, but given the circumstances, we decided to pre-record a live discussion so our speakers can spend their time live chatting with you on YouTube. Wait till the end because speakers will appear live in video uh, to answer a few of your questions from the YouTube chat and Google form in the comments. So please remember to subscribe, give us a thumbs up and comment below and use the chat feature. But now it is my pleasure to in introduce our moderator, Eve Salty from Google. Eve. Thank you, Todd. I really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. My name is Eve Salty. I'm the head of strategic platforms for Google, and I'm really excited to be welcome all of you to uh, this webcast. Uh, we hope that it's a great conversation and we want it to be as interactive as possible. So as Todd mentioned, please use the chat feature and ask your questions. We'll be answering them live. I'm really, really excited uh, to have a, an amazing um, panel with us to today to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and the future of work, which is a hot topic for everyone, especially now, and especially in the greater LA area. And um, I'd like to introduce them. Um, first, we have uh, Mitra Best, who is the lead partner for strategic innovations and te technology for PwC. So welcome. We have SK Gupta, who is the director for the Center for Advanced Manufacturing at the University of Southern California. We have Fer Fernanda Carapina, who is the founder and CEO of 4Digital.com. And we have Nina Gortinsky, who is the co-founder and co-CEO of SkywideLogic.com. So welcome all. And uh, let's uh, get start started. Uh, um, specifically, um, we heard about a couple of different research studies that came up uh, recently. One uh, stating that 60% of the businesses that can be automated, that can be automated in the next uh, uh, five years. And also, on the other hand, we've seen uh, Gartner predicting that by 2020, AI will produce uh, more jobs than it dis displaces. At the same time, we're living unprecedented times during a crisis that, that nobody really pre predicted and has um, really devastating uh, impacts in the employability, especially in the area with uh, unemployment reaching more than 30% here in Southern Cal California. So a lot of things changed during the past couple of months. So I'd like to ask Mitra, if you can summarize how the recent crisis uh, is impacting employers and employees uh, from your vantage point. Very good question. I think this pandemic is an accelerator for a lot of our hypotheses about future of work. I see that it's accelerating uh, going digital, it's accelerating going mobile, and it's accelerating that blended workforce that's a combination of humans and, and machines. So in terms of digital, um, look, we're, we were supposed to meet together at your offices in Google today and have this, and we're on video. Everybody's on you know, using video, um, where most of commerce is online. Um, doctors are seeing patients through telemedicine and basically cash is giving way to digital payments. Companies that have a strong technology and in infrastructure and, and have advanced digital solutions won't get, won't have a negative impact. They actually will accelerate their success for the future. What we're seeing is that other firms, other organizations that have been reluctant to automate or engage in digital solutions are now rapidly scrambling mm -hmm. to just to maintain business continuity. So this pandemic is really forcing that sort of overnight digital uh, transformation for a lot of organizations, which has an you know, investment impact on the employers, but it also has an impact on employees. They have to be um, they have to get upskilled to to stay relevant and and be accretive. Um, the other part of it is mobile. Um, we know that we've talked about future of work enabling a lot of mobility and flexibility. Look, we've we're now 16 million in the U.S. working from home. 
um, up from, you know, five or six million before the pandemic. And this is for organizations that have that infrastructure to do that. Now you can work from anywhere, anytime. Right now we're working from home, but I think that this will stick in a way that will change how employers think about real estate because more people are going to see the benefits of working from home, the flexibility that it gives them. So real estate will become an issue. Um, How do you monitor and manage productivity will become um, a a question for employers. And um, I think in terms of employees, how do they manage their career paths and their learning when they're siloed and not inside of an organization where a lot of people are co-located, so that physical space. And in terms of the blended workforce, I think this, again, that push to um, use uh, advanced technologies to shore up some of your resiliency. We've seen companies, and I know SK will probably talk about um, the impact on manufacturing, but think about the supply chain disruptions around the world. Um, if you have more um, automation, more robots in your ma- in your manufacturing plants, um, you you basically are more resilient to some of these um, pandemics and crises that will that will come about. So, having employers think about that blended workforce of people and um, machines, I think, is super important. And in just in terms of people, it's not just full time employees now. You have to think about independent contractors because this pandemic will change the way people want to work. It will change, um, it will have an impact on gig workers. And I think another class of um, the entities in the workforce will be startups that employers can engage with through their investments. So now they have to think about, you know, how do I make the compensation model for all these different entities? How do I measure? Um, productivity and manage my efficiencies. And I think at its core, it will redefine what work means. And it will change it from more of an effort-based hourly input to more of an outcome-based model. So thank you, Mitra. This was really, really insightful. And you touched on a couple of trends and points that we're going to unpack for the remainder of the conversation, such as uh, how do we measure pro- productivity now that a lot of uh, employees are working remotely? How do we upskill them and reskill them to make sure that they can use the, the latest te- technologies to continue being productive and collaborative. Um, And you also mentioned supply chain. So I'd like to turn to SK uh, and uh, ask a specific question for the manufacturing industry that we see um, heavily impacted by, um, you know, the current crisis. We see dramatic changes in supply chain. We uh, we see increased demand for modernization and digitalization in the manufacturing industry. So I'd like to um, get your point of view on what are some of the short-term and the long-term impacts that you see in the manufacturing industry in specific? Uh, thank you, Eve, for inviting me to this panel. So manufacturing uh, had a whole bunch of challenges and issues that were emerging before. So people were concerned about actually shortage of the right kind of labor. Uh, people were also very really sensitive to the cost and also quality consistency and and many other factors, which were basically requiring manufacturing sector to take a look at the automation, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence to provide solutions to those challenges. What has happened since uh, COVID-19 crisis, the social distancing requirement basically required many manufacturing operations to simply shut down. So now we have other sets of challenges. How do you even open up your operation where you really need to enforce social distancing? So meaning that even though previously you might have found that robotics and automation, you were not ready for it, or you needed a little bit more time or capital or training your workforce, now you have no other option. If you want to be in business and if you want to really enforce social distancing and be safe and make sure that you're not 
impacting, you know, basically the product that you're making, then you have to start embracing uh, robotics and automation in a big way. And the companies which were ready and they were using robotics and automation previously are much better prepared because now what they can do is that they can start scaling those things and, you know, adopting those lessons which they already had and, and keep deploying more and more robotics and automation. Some of the companies which previously had stayed away from it for capital reasons or you know, basically the workforce not being ready for it or they were concerned about other aspects of it are struggling and they have to figure it out very quickly uh, how to embrace it and get ready for it because a lot of ways of doing things uh, you know, as they were done before where people were working very close to each other simply not going to be practical at this point. Because if you don't come up with a solution, then uh, you would be, you know, to shut down again. So many people have been now exploring what, why you need a, you know, basically physical presence on the line. And also that simply means that what kind of training do you need if you're going to use other technology? So in the short term, a lot of people are now thinking about capital and retraining uh, people to make sure that you can get back to production. So that's the kind of short-term employability and employment picture that's emerging, that you know, people need to really quickly train people or hire external consultant advisors who can help the team in getting ready for it. The longer-term manufacturing is going to go through significant changes. Basically, people are realizing that uh, the, the model which was being used in the past is not a scalable model. So you have to really make sure that humans are used when they're absolutely necessary. And if there were solutions that were available to you and if you are not deploying them for some other constraints, you have to seriously look at it. So I think the nature of work will fundamentally change in the manufacturing sector. Uh, once you start embracing robotics, AI, automation, it opens up new business opportunities for you. So there are lots of new things can be done, lots of new business opportunities can be created. So that's going to be happening over, over the next few years. That's great. Thank you so much. And we definitely see uh, automation and robotics become these game changers uh, in manufacturing and certainly in other industries as well. Um, and you also touched on specific kind of like some of the specific tasks that, you know, either um, will be augmented through AI or will be uh, maybe eliminated or further automated. And um, of course, coming from the Google side, I believe that AI will help people do their jobs be be better. Um, for example, we see specific uh, um, jobs like an uh, anesthesiologists, nurses, health tech, te tech technologists, and I think Mitra, you brought that up, that are really benefiting from um, you know, the augmentation uh, op uh, opportunities with AI. And we also see some other jobs like as cashier servers, may maybe drivers. Um, these roles are becoming more and more automated. Um, uh, Gartner uh, reported that by 2022, one in five workers engaged in non-routine tasks will rely on AI to get the work done. So now AI, it's, it's becoming more and more an integral part of how we do our, our work, depend, um, regardless of the industry or the type of work. So I have a question for Nina, Nina specifically. Um, how do you see the uh, the role of AI in the workforce play space and how are you leveraging AI in uh, kind of like, you know, the, in, the, in the company that, um, you know, you uh, ma manage and if you have any early re results that you already see. So we've been doing comprehensive research on this subject because it's something that we already knew was going to be a huge issue that was fundamentally going to change our society. What we also didn't expect is that COVID-19 would hit and actually accelerate that timeline, as you mentioned. So what we started noticing was, for example, the World Economic Forum outlined that by 2022, each individual is going to have to spend 101 days of learning just to keep up with the latest technology. Most people today don't know how to learn. So 
a lot of the skills and upskilling conversation involves not only how to do the job, but also these soft skills that are so imperative to actually being able to sustain that job. Skills like communication. I mean, skills like adaptability, learnability. Um, it, it's really no longer just can you learn the job because that job is going to be sh- changing so quickly and so rapidly that it's more can you adapt and are you comfortable with learning something new on a consistent basis? Because if you don't, you're going to lose that job. The excitement where I agree with you, Eve, is that artificial intelligence opens up so many doors to limitless possibilities for companies. You can finally go and leverage exponential technology to take your business and within a year, what would normally take 10 years. However, in order to do that, we as all the employees who want to work at these companies are going to have to make some changes within our own kind of comfort level. And I think as Mitra mentioned, you now have four generations in the workplace. And some are far more comfortable learning new skills and being kind of told that what they knew before and the world they knew before is no longer there. I mean, the other reality is we're in the fourth industrial revolution. We are actually officially in an industrial revolution. Anytime that there's been a revolution in the past, you're going to have the old way of doing things get displaced. And I think we're seeing just how quickly that's a reality with COVID-19. So one of the ways that we sort of started tackling this issue was we needed to create more comprehensive assessments because Myers-Briggs, DISC, Bloomberg, that gives you only so much information about an individual, but you don't actually understand them fully as a person. You can sort of get some of the soft skills, but there's been sort of this gap. And so we were trying to really bridge that gap and make more comprehensive assessments so that when we're matching people to jobs and suggesting which kind of certifications should they go to, that we're one, having proper partnerships in place as a company so that if they're a great fit for Microsoft, that we can send them to Microsoft. If their personality doesn't fit with a Microsoft, let's cut that out even as a real thing that we're pushing onto them because the goal really is like, people finding jobs that truly fulfill them. We've been seeing the retention issues across across the board. I mean, companies, especially for millennials, will still see the stats fully on Gen Zs as they're working. They haven't been staying at companies. And that's been costing major corporations a lot of money for each time they have to go after a year and fill in their role. If we want to keep these individuals engaged, we do have to also be thinking about things like impact and what makes them uh, really tick, which is, by the way, very different across the different generations. So it is a communication problem, as well as ensuring that we're really thinking through as many of the factors as possible. And that's where artificial intelligence is so helpful. Because if one, one person or a team of 10 was trying to go and structure this data to be able to solve these questions, there's no way to do it in a fast enough time span. We kind of have to move so quickly because right now everyone's been already impacted due to COVID alone. So if we want to get people back to work, it is the the fact is we have to use artificial intelligence. Um, there's no way for us to do it faster. I mean, the supercomputers are able to go and compute like things that the rest of us. I mean, I want to say me too. You probably know this better, but it's probably like ten years if we were trying to calculate it. They do it in a couple hours. I mean, it, it's amazing if we're able to leverage artificial intelligence to really work with us. It's not aimed to work against us. It's really a tool that can benefit us and give us far more holistically beneficial lives. We just have to go and set up the systems, we as individuals, because it's not artificial intelligence that's going to set up those systems. We're the ones providing the inputs for the computer. So we just have to think through what inputs are we trying to see in our society so that we can really make the right impact and see the world we want to wake up to tomorrow. You're absolutely right. Thank you so much for that. And you're right also on kind of like the need for additional and ongoing learning because it doesn't stop, it doesn't end. It has to be on an ongoing basis for all generations. And also the need to develop these soft skills because uh, these are creative critical, um, uh, these have critical value to, um, to employability as, as well. 
Um, so we talked about specific um, maybe uh, roles that um, we see impacted from AI innovations. We also see some new professions that uh, might be emerging because of AI. So Fer- Fer- Fernanda, from your vantage point, uh, what do you see, um, which uh, kind of like areas or roles do you see more impacted positively or negatively from AI? Uh, I think that if you're um, in a profession where you do the same function over and over and over again, there's a lot of repeatability to the work that you do, and there is a pattern to the work that you do, then that is a perfect position that could be replaced by AI. So um, one example might be, for example, if you're in the legal profession and you're a clerk or you're a paralegal and your job is to look for certain historical cases to build a, um, to build a case around, um, you know, digesting huge voluminous data on historical cases is something that a computer could do relatively quickly. And you can create inputs for, you know, what it is that you're searching for so that instead of going through, you know, a thousand cases, you're then, you know, you have your lawyers looking at 10 cases that may be relevant. Um, You know, these systems are never perfect, um, as we were just discussing, and humans make mistakes with these inputs, and that's part of the bias problem that exists with with AI and will continue to exist, and that's something we have to be really mindful of. But again, it Anything that is repetitive, um, kind of mindless work, um, and I don't mean to say that kind of in a derogatory way, but if there's not a lot of variation in the work that's done, if you're pushing a lot of paper, um, that's a perfect area for AI. Thank, th- thank you so much, Fernanda. You're absolutely right. And uh, we see that the traditional workplace, the traditional conception of work is changing due to, to the digital uh, economy. So maybe a double click to that. Now that we're seeing that more and more of us are working remotely and this is kind of uh, yeah. uh, em- emerging as a, as a new trend, how should we redefine the concept of work? How, how do you see it in your company or in the companies that you work with? Yeah. So I, I really believe that now we're entering into an era where it's no longer going to be about the number of hours that you work. Full-time work, I think, is out the window. And um, someone within my company coined the term free-range work, which I think is, is really meant to point to the output and the focus on output and the quality of your work and being more project oriented as opposed to being tied to a number of hours that you work every week. And I think for individuals that um, have worked in an entrepreneurial way, as I have for many years now, this is really what we do 24 seven. And it doesn't really matter if you start at seven in the morning and you wrap at three or if you put in four hours in the morning and eight hours at night, it's really where you're able to work the best. And as long as you're able to deliver your um, projects and your output on time and obviously with quality. So I think it's really going to force people to become a lot more um, self-motivated and uh, have to create their own structure, which for some people is incredible freedom and they're really good at it. For other people, it'll be incredibly challenging. And I think for those that are in the startup community, um, this is, you know, second nature. So um, I think that there will be a lot of opportunities potentially for individuals who are in the startup ecosystem to do some work for more structured corporations that may need um, some specialization in their um, in their staffing and in their product services that younger companies that are a little bit more fluid and um, are more on the leading edge of these solutions can really help to augment what they're already doing. That's absolutely true. And I think it goes back to the skills that we were discussing with Nina around the the need to relearn the how as much as the what. So how do we 
work and be more pro, pro, productive without having face-to-face interactions? And also, how do we self-regulate? How do we um, self-motivate? Uh, but I know, Mitra, speak, speaking of, uh, of that new norm of, uh, of work, I know you're working with a lot of different companies and different organizations in various industries. Uh, how do you see this new norm kind of like, you know, manifesting it, it, it itself? And also, can you talk about, we talked about... Uh, you know, robotics and automation entering into the into the uh, work life. How do you see that interaction between machine learning and humans? So you asked a few questions. I'll, I'll um, unpack them. Um, first, I think going back to um, what I shared earlier about the pandemic really accelerating the future of work, and Fernanda talked about this as well. I don't think the new norm is going to be. Um, the same as what we were used to. Think about pre-pandemic. We have statistics around productivity. Um, Organizations that allow work from home are 20 to 25% more productive. I mean, those are undisputed facts. Um, Real estate is around $10,000 per person. So you think about that annually. So you think about that. And you think about the the numbers associated with turnover. Organizations that allow work from home have around 20% less turnover. So people are happier, to Nina's point, about liking what you do and how you do it. And, And so I think the new norm is going to see a lot more flexibility and mobility in the workforce. And that introduces the whole concept of how do we monitor productivity? We are no longer interested in when you did the work um, from eight, like Fernando was saying, from seven to three or from eight to five. We're really interested in the output. We're interested in the deliverables. And when you start to introduce technology into the workforce, you can't measure the robot's time. You can measure, I mean, you can, but the, you know, the time is so insignificant. It's not a measure. The measure is really about how fast you're producing something, not about how many, not, not about your input of hours. So I think that redefinition of work is about outcome-based models enabled by various types of human workers, including startups and, and machines. And, and, you know, people talk about um, the displacement of people around Um, as you progress with advancements in machine learning. And you ask the question, you know, what is that interaction between humans and machines? Can machines, you know, can machines be empathetic and be creative and be curious? Um, Those are very essential skills of humans and um, very existential question for people like me who work in AI um, and, and think about, um, that that differential between humans and machines. The machine learning algorithms are fantastic at doing um, outperforming humans in tasks. Again, Fernanda and Nina both talked about that. But they're not really that close to that intelligent replicants we we read about in sci-fi books or or see in movies. But there are major advances that are being made in creativity, in curiosity, in um, empathy around algorithms and how they learn. So, you know, we know that there are machine learning algorithms that are, that are um, drawing pictures, that are composing music, um, that are writing stories. Those are creative tasks, but they aren't, they, they're not coming they come from learning to do those tasks. They don't come from a yearning to be creative as humans do, which has a major um, longer tail of motivation and quality, actually. Empathy, you know, algorithms are taught to um, prioritize the more empathetic responses. They're, they're prioritizing. They're not actually empathetic. Um, and in terms of curiosity, sort of the curiosity rewards, which is this new model of 
um, learning to uh, teach them, teach the algorithms to explore and reward them when they um, when they're interacting with um, you know unpredictable uh, models or unpredictable data and disincentivizing them if if the task gets boring or doesn't have efficiency. All of those things, I wanted to mention those because if we have viewers who are um, AI researchers, they're going to get very um, protective of the progress that they've made. And we don't want to say, we wanted to acknowledge that. But I want to say that for the foreseeable futures, humans win at empathy, curiosity, creativity, innovation, which is what is going to drive us forward. We are the ones who are, you know, building those models. We are the ones that are building, um, that are providing those inputs in terms of data. So um, I think it, it's it's not going, we're not going to become extinct because of machine learning and AI. And then I wanted to also touch on something that SK talked about in terms of manufacturing and introducing uh, robotics and automation and AI into um, mm-hmm. manufacturing. Think about that in terms of what that does to the supply chain as well, because transportation was also interrupted and has been interrupted, right? So when you have, when all of your goods are not sort of, you're not vertically integrated and you have to have a supply chain, uh, transportation becomes a disruptor. So you think about 3D printing for localized manufacturing once you figure out sort of the IP issues around that or, um, you know, improve the quality, um, enabling um, tracking through AI to make sure that your supply ch- you know where your supply chain is at and how it's performing. All of those things are going to be super important. They will displace jobs, but they will replace a lot more jobs. They, a lot more jobs will be created as a result of all of these advancements than will be displaced. You're absolutely right. And we definitely see that across the board, post-pandemic, a lot of these digital transformation projects or initiatives are being uh, really uh, accelerated uh, across the board. We're seeing that in retail, we're seeing that in even in travel and, and, and hospitality that was very much impacted from. Everyone is looking to change the business mo- model and really take advantage of AI, machine learning, big data and other kind of like tech technological uh, advancements so that they can uh, continue to differentiate them, them themselves and, and not only towards biz- business continuity, but also towards business growth. Um, and you also build, uh, bring up a, a good point around uh, the fact that, you know, uh, humans still differentiate them, them, them themselves or, or ourselves because of the emotional intelligence that we bring. It's we are the ones who are building these algorithms. So a question that I have for SK then, it's like, you know, I mean, obviously we see the proliferation of AI and machine lear- learning models across multiple uh, pro professions and, um, you know, industries and verticals. What is the role of the government in in this? Because right now, I don't feel like things are heavily regulated. A lot of, uh, um, you know, the high tech companies are self-regulating this to make sure that, you know, uh, this goes well from an implementation standpoint. But as we're looking at uh, the the broader labor market, um, how do you view the government's role into this? In order to make sure we have the right governance and the right protectiveness around it. Sure. So before answering uh, that question, I would like to briefly comment on basically, uh, you know, how AI and robot and automation actually help humans in manufacturing, right? So as, you know, previous panelists have, you know, said that future is going to be all about offering value, right? So people are not going to be measured based upon how much time they spend on work, but what value they can offer. So what is beginning to happen is that, you know, as humans don't have to do tedious physical tasks or tedious computer tasks, they can offer much better value to their end customers. See, in the manufacturing sector, now the dream of affordable personalization is there. You can make products which are personalized. 
So where human can play a bigger role. Now, earlier we were not able to do it because if you wanted to personalize things, the cost penalty would have been so high that nobody will be able to afford it, right? But on the other hand, if your physical fabrication is automated, then there's no reason for us not to do affordable personalization. So basically, use of automation in robotics is also enabling humans to offer basically much higher value. I mean, a worker who doesn't have to do the welding by themselves can now actually improve your overall process because the worker can make the robot go much faster. A robot can actually be programmed to give you much higher consistency and quality, right? So worker can play significantly better role. You know, product uh, can be optimized now because quality is much more consistent. So there are lots of roles that, you know, human workers can play as they start using the power of AI, machine learning, and automation. So, so in the manufacturing beginning to happen, the people are actually able to offer value now as a result of coexisting with these technologies and exploiting these technologies. So at least in the manufacturing sector, we are seeing that automation, machine learning, AI is being viewed as an assistance to humans and then human can then deliver significantly better value. So that's kind of what we are beginning to see there. So we are not necessarily seeing that these technologies are gonna replace human and people are gonna get the same product. The idea is that these technology will augment human capabilities and therefore we will be able to offer people much better product and services and therefore the quality of life will be better for everybody as a result of you know, deploying this. So that, that just wanted to add that piece so that it's clear that it's not just that from cost saving perspective, we want to use this technology, but improving the overall quality of life, it's essential that we use these technologies and therefore we can offer much better quality product. And also in, in process, people you know, uh, do much more fulfilling job than welding whole day long, right? I mean, now you are actually doing more interesting job than, than you know, keep doing the same thing over and over all day long. So that's the dimension that I wanted to add to the conversation. Now, coming back to your second question, there are significant issues which are being raised uh, in the context of basically manufacturing as people are beginning to use basically AI robotics automation. And of course, many of these concerns are related to the safety because anytime you're going to start having now robots or uh, you know, automated guided vehicles which are being used on a factory floor, then what happens to worker safety? I mean, are companies being responsible enough to test the technology and absolutely make sure that these technologies are safe? And even though, let's say, testing made it safe, but what happens if hacking work takes place? What if, if a cyber attack takes place? Who is responsible for it then? What if, you know, basically somebody used it in a slightly inappropriate way in the factory? Then who is responsible for it, right? So there are a number of concerns that basically come due to the safety, security, and of course, government will have to be involved in playing a role to make sure that appropriate measures are in place and technologies get appropriately regulated. Because without that, again, few accidents might just disrupt the entire progress. So that's a one dimension where government uh, has to play a role. And the second aspect is that when uh, humans start interacting with AI and, and robotics and automation, there's a lot of data is being collected about the humans themselves who are interacting with this technology, right? And now that can be used to make inferences about their capability, their health. There's a lot of you know, other information which is being collected, which then is compromising their privacy. So now, how do we regulate that? So for example, let's say if I'm interacting with a robot and robot is consistently observing that, you know, that my left hand is not exerting as much force as my right hand is. And perhaps that is a, you know, something related to some onset of some health issue. Robot knows that, system knows that, right? Now, what happens in that case? You know, what happens with that data? Uh, 
should I have you know, that information? Should my manager have that information? So lots of privacy-related issues are also going to be start coming up. And these are brand new issues that people have not explored before. So many concerns are going to be coming up as people start using AI and automation more and more frequently. And government will have to be involved. Many of these things have to be regulated. There have to be new policies uh, which have to be put in place. So yes, government will have to play a major role because we have not seen this level of concerns or issues emerge uh, with respect to the previous generation of technology. You're right. It's about data privacy, security, and safety. And we see more and more the collaboration of the private sector working with state and local governments and the federal government to really start putting together some of these considerations and regulations so that we can make sure that we can still innovate, but everybody's safe. Um, a double click to kind of some of the other considerations. And uh, Mitra, you brought up the fact that, you know, AI models are basically human built mo- mo- models. At the same time, um, I want to turn to uh, Ni- Ni- Nina and, Fer- and Fernanda and get your perspective around the ethical considerations. There are a lot of conversations around AI and ethical considerations. Um, how do we prevent bias and false negatives? We're dealing with large uh, da- data sets, um, but uh, also we want to be mindful in what goes into these algorithms to make sure that they're fairly unbiased and fair. So how do you see some of these ethical considerations pan out? I think that um, in our case and the work that that we do with behavioral data analytics um, in social media, for example, where you're looking at social accounts and you're trying to assess whether an account is actually a human account or it's a bot account and you're looking at human behavior versus bot behavior. Um, in training our algorithms to do that, uh, it's, it takes extensive work. And one of the key factors is, you know, obviously you're creating ground truth, you're doing knowledge engineering, you're really evaluating um, certain um, features that indicate human activity versus non-human activity. And you start coding that into the system so that the algorithm will be able to recognize, oh, this is typically something that a human will do. Oh, this is typically something that a bot will do. When you do that, all that data initially, uh, we believe, really needs to be hand tagged. So it's kind of analogous to when you go on a website and they want to prove that you're a human, they ask you to click on the images of, um, you know, click on a car image. And you're training these algorithms so that they know to recognize that, oh, that's what a car looks like. So when you have humans do this, it's important that you have diverse ages, diverse sexes, looking at this data and tagging it. Because what a man is going to perceive as, um, let's say, a, um, a comment about family or a comment about love or uh, something that is tied to anger and rage may be different than what a woman would do or say, and would be different than what a young person might say or do. So just like, uh, just like we do oftentimes, like in a perfect world where you want diversity in your representation in your workforce so that you have different voices, although we often feel that that's definitely not the case, it becomes incredibly important in algorithmic development because otherwise your algorithms are just duplicating the biases that have existed in the workforce and in corporate America for years. So now is an opportunity for us to really tackle that. So one other consideration is the security um, piece of AI development, where one ethical consideration is all the good that AI can do for us as a culture and as a civilization. It also has a dark side and it can be used by hackers to scale and to be incredibly efficient and impactful in impersonating people, in um, spamming people, I mean, in launching social engineering attacks. So it's incredibly important as AI innovators that we all put security um, at the top of the list with our product development goals so that security features are an automatic consideration and not a 
afterthought once a product is development, developed and when it's launched. Because otherwise, what ends up happening is a product is released into a marketplace, people start using it, then it gets hacked, then there are lawsuits, then people go back and try to patch the problem. And um, given the advancement that we are now seeing, it's incredibly important that we as uh, entrepreneurs really address that as a important priority uh, right up front. So to add to what Fernando was saying, and I completely agree with your assessment of how to mitigate for some of the biases, I think another way that you can do that is also to incorporate gamification and to actually leverage gamification and like the main intrinsic motivators of individuals, keeping into account that based on that, that gives you certain insights that you should train your algorithm because there are inherent biases if let's say you're more motivated by feeling smart and by structure. But through gamification, you're actually able to slowly start teaching people to not necessarily have their same biases. Um, because for example, if you go and show them hundreds of images, they'll, they're they going to start picking up on their own biases and starting to change their own patterns a lot of the times. So there's like a lot of ways to also start leveraging so much of the data that we have to also start teaching people to not be as biased. Um, and I think that's that's something that we're also trying to play with of how do you start leveraging older principles of gamification put into new contexts to actually improve artificial intelligence. So I wanted to build on both Fernanda and, and Nina's um, responses to you around regulation and also kind of piggyback off of what SK said. Um, you know, as a, as a champion for innovation, people automatically assume that I'm anti-regulation. And um, I, I'm anti-being controlled <laughs> by anyone or any entity, but I do see the value of framework and standards as something that is important to our public safety and in general. So we have agencies like the FDA, the FCC, you know, we, we have FDIC, we have a lot of agencies that are regulating different parts of um, our, our business world and our consumer world really for the protection of, of its citizens. And AI and the proliferation of decision-making software, like Fernanda said, it's duplicating our biases in those because we're humans building those tools and we're giving it the input and the data that that we feel connected with. So depending on who's doing that, you're, you're going to get that bend and that filter. But I think it's more dangerous than that. I think it's actually amplifying a lot of our biases. And so I think that's a really important part. The privacy issue that SK brought up, I think is tremendous. We keep trading off convenience for privacy and we can't keep going. It's like frogs in boiling water. We have to make sure that um, we have a balance there. And I do believe that um, it's a difficult challenge to solve because it's very complicated. If you ask 20 people what's fair, they're going to come up with you know, 20 different answers at minimum. And how do, you, how do you then enforce, how do you translate those social constructs of bias, discrimination, and um, equality into metrics and, and regulatory um, aspects? So that's why I think, back to what you said earlier, it's really important for public and private partnerships to come together here and try to solve this um, in a meaningful way, in a doable way, not just in a check the box kind of way, but truly meaningful so that we don't distance ourselves from, um, I think, what, what Fernanda called the dark side, but we actually create measures to have an equitable, inclusive, and safe um, world to live in. Sure. So there are two issues. I just want to make sure that you know people talk about the, those two issues uh, often at the same time. But we just want to kind of understand that there are issues which arise because of unintentional biases that people have, and they get propagated into the system. And then there are actors with malicious intent, and they are you know intentionally trying to you know, break the system and do things differently. Now these two are 
different problem and they will require different solutions. So we have to be prepared that, I mean, these may require entirely different strategies. And also, as we start thinking about, you know, how to provide oversights, uh, these would be different kind of oversights. So we have to just make sure that these two issues are recognized as separate issues and then we develop the appropriate oversight side to deal with each issue separately. Yes, and I think that's a really good point, SK, because they are very different. And that brings up another topic that we raised. I think it was Fernanda, again, who raised it around um, responsibility. So when, or maybe you raised it, um, it's around responsibility of who is, do, do you now, if a, if, a pro, if a ML model perpetrated discrimination against a certain group, who is responsible for that? The coder, the employer, the the person who used it? I mean, where where do we draw those lines? And in terms of what you were bifurcating, um, unintentional, um, unconscious biases seeping into the system versus bad actors intentionally um, perpetrating bad behavior, that also goes back to the responsibility because you have to have regulation and legislation that doesn't depend on the person who interprets it, that it's really clear cut so that we can we can enforce it in the in a most effective way. Absolutely. I think you all bring up really, really great points, especially, I mean, this is a very complex uh, issue and it's an evolving issue because, uh, yes, absolutely, Mitre, we have to have the right standards and frameworks and this need to be evolving as the tech, technology is evolving as the implementations are changing. Also, there needs to be several checkpoints on all sides, on the um, engineering side to make sure that this unintentional or this unconscious bias doesn't seep in uh, and there are checks and balances on uh, uh, the te technology side. But also I think there is a responsibility on the consumer side to make sure that we always check where uh, the, da the data that we provide is, is going, where are they doing, um, and be vigilant across the board. Um, so I think we... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I just really quickly wanted to jump in on this other fact that it's really easy to uh, say that it's bad if something's biased, but I actually think that there is a benefit to us also seeing what are the biases that even with machine learning, even when we're trying to be neutral, are coming out, because then we're able to start finding better ways to mitigate for those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I just have to respond to that. Sorry to interrupt you, Eve. Um, I think that that is true. However, I think that really necessitates that there's complete transparency by the companies that are creating algorithms and embedding them into their systems so that you can assess whether or not there are biases. Because oftentimes we use products and services all the time that are algorithmically driven and you have no idea what the assumptions are that have been programmed in. So therefore you don't really know that there are um, biases. Um, there's biases, for example, in streaming services in the products that are being served up to you to watch. And we don't really know that, but it exists. So I think that really um, plays to the importance of um, having you know, governmental oversight and having a kind of a review body to make sure that it's equal opportunity um, exposure for for content, for knowledge, um, for opportunities, et cetera. But what I do have to add to what you're saying, and I 100% agree, is that there is a huge learning curve that pretty much everyone will have to undergo, especially, I agree with government oversight, but that means that everybody within the government has to truly understand what are, oh yeah, all of the inputs and all of the pieces. And that in and of itself for a lot of people is already a roadblock. So we have to also figure out the, how to teach all of this in a very dissectable way so that pretty much across the board as a society, we can understand what's actually being discussed. It is partnership by everybody. You know, I, I can't agree with you more. There are stakeholders that we are not even identifying on this panel right now that will come to us you know, 
later, <laughs> but it, it is truly a partnership that needs to happen. Private, public, consumer, like Eve said, um, AI researchers, um, psychologists, you know, a lot of people need to play a role in, in figuring out our future uh, because we are at that precipice of um, change that will be sticking. Great. So let me help us shift gears and talk a little bit about the few, few future. As we said, this is an evolving uh, world and uh, we see rapid changes that are being even uh, accelerated now with the pandemic. So, And we see a lot of uh, interesting sen- scenarios how AI is kind of like seeping into everyday um, work and everyday life. We see, for example, the airport in Cincinnati and northern Kentucky where they're using AI to really uh, monitor the restroom so that they can um, send the right janitorial staff so that they can clean at the right times and they can optimize uh, that process. We see the Dallas Children's Hospital partnering with an AI organization as well to predict significant pollen events so that they can further uh, alert their nurses to take um, uh, plants into motion. Uh, So we see this more and more kind of like becoming part of our life. So I want to ask Mitra and SK maybe to give us kind of like a glimpse into the future. Uh, How can we and future generations, um, what can we do to better prepare for these jobs of the future? Well, I'll go first. Um, This rapid pace of technology advancement is really making it very unpredictable um, to to know what are the future jobs. And when you think about the half-life of skills being reduced from 30 years to five years, what is it that you need to prepare, you need to learn to prepare for those jobs of the future? Um, last summer, I spoke at, um, to uh, interns, at summer interns that were going back to uh, university at the end of summer, um, a few thousand of them. And one of the questions that came up was, what should we study when we go back for our senior year to be better prepared when we get out of school? And my immediate answer was, you know, make sure that you take um, a class in data. Because, you know, understand where data comes from, understand how to um, get insights from it, understand how to make those insights actionable. Because every technology, the only thing I can predict is that everything is going to be based on data. So if you don't understand data, it's going to be very difficult for you to interact with the new technologies or the current technologies that we have. But really, the most important thing that I said to them, or what I tried to um, impart, was Learning is not going to be over at the end of your senior year. What you really need is to fall in love with learning and to recognize that you will always need to be on around learning new skills. And it's not just about technology skills or technical skills. Those essential skills of analytical thinking, reasoning, creativity, leadership, How do you mentor people? How do you collaborate effectively? How do you communicate with um, intent and purpose? Those are things that I think will prepare us best for the jobs of the future. To have a crystal ball and say, these are the new generation of jobs that we're going to have, it's, it's conjecture and we'll only come kind of close to maybe in the next three to five years. We're never going to be able to say in 10, 20 years, these are the jobs, but we know what we need to create those jobs, to create that future together, and to thrive in that future together. Um, and, and I know we take that very seriously at, at PwC. We've pledged um, $3 billion to job training, uh, kicked in last year. Um, last year, we trained everybody at PwC to um, upskill in, in uh, data visualization, in, in storytelling, in uh, digital storytelling, in building bots and um, creating, you know, um, automations that are automating the processes that we work on today, but all of that infused with soft skills at the same time. So I think it's really important to um, 
make sure that agility, flexibility, and those essential skills that humans are now winning um, versus um, machines it, are, are, are being leveraged um, effectively. And lastly, I just want to mention that we at PwC just uh, released a, an internal app called the Digital Fitness app that we have to measure our digital fitness and make sure that we're continuously upskilled. We just made that available to everyone. And by everyone, I mean everyone in the world. So for free. And so this, you can take this fitness test. You can um, see what your score is, your recommendations for upskilling, and you can learn some new things and take it again. And if you just put it in your a Google search bar, digital fitness app, it'll take you to the free page. So I would like to add a few more things to what Pitta said. She very eloquently you know, presented what, what things can be done. A few more things I'd like to add to that. So one thing basically which I tell students is that you know, humans' role in the future is going to be really analyzing really messy things for which you know, there's no structure to it really big challenges for which there's no obvious solution or answer. You really need to get into problem solving more, figure it out, what value can be offered. So you really want to start now mastering things where, uh, which are kind of defying the traditional you know, frameworks. So learn how to do that. Get into a messy situation, figure it out, what value you can offer to the world. And that is that a skill near foreseeable future would be really useful to you. The second thing that you can do is that everybody is emphasizing that you need to learn lifelong, and that's going to be true. But learning efficiently is going to be also very important. So make sure that not only you're learning throughout your life, but figure it out how you're going to learn efficiently. Because every few months, you will be given things for which you know nothing about, and you will have two days to learn about, right? So you better learn how to learn very efficiently. Figure it out, what kind of person you are, what works for you, because what worked for somebody else may not work for you. So kind of understand yourself that what works for you, how do you learn, how do you learn more efficiently, and, and be prepared that throughout your life, you'll be learning. And if you're not going to be learning, uh, then you're not going to survive in this world. So that's the second thing that I'm just telling people. And the third aspect is that, you know, uh, we are engineers, uh, or I interact with a lot of engineers. Uh, you know, in our curriculum, interaction with people are not emphasized. So I tell people that, look, your job as an engineer and teacher is going to be start interacting with people. So you better get comfortable in interviewing lots of people, understand what they're thinking, uh, try to really get deeper into it and understand, build your network so that you really understand where the needs are, what value you can offer. So to summarize, basically, work on really messy problems, which defy, you know, basically a, a routine framework to formulate the problem so that you can offer new value, which, you know, computer will not be able to offer right now. Figure it out, how do you learn most efficiently, master that skill, because you'll be learning new things every week and interact with as many people as you can uh, to understand what their needs are, because ultimately, as a human, you are the only one who will understand what other humans want. And if you understand other humans and you can figure it out what value they need, then you'll be successful and you will be employed. Everything else we don't know, the future is completely uncertain. So. <laughs> No, this is great. You both bring great points, uh, especially around the need for lifelong learning and for these 21st century skills that will really help us be more adaptable and uh, more kind of in the forefront of uh, what change might come. I want to also end with Fernanda and Nina, uh, specifically around what skills. I mean, we talked about, I think, both Mitra and SK uh, touched on, on that. But what are some of the best practices that you can offer to our audience, specifically around career development and how they can continue to drive their prof professional success? Uh, I think my, one of my number ones is getting... Comfortable with the unknown, 
and really starting to explore things that you might have never even heard of. Um, that I think becomes that curi- that curiosity. First of all, is one of the skills that research is saying you're going to need anyways. But getting curious so that you can start identifying what should be your first learning point. I mean, to SK's point, you're going to have to be learning so many things. Get you have to get comfortable learning. But if you're already going to be learning, at least be interested in what you're learning, because that passion and that energy translates to work. And there's so many jobs that artificial intelligence is going to be creating. So having that insatiable curiosity will open unlimited doors because more and more companies, you don't need to have the degree. Certifications don't take that long, but you need to really figure out what it is you want to be doing first. And then that'll lead you to the next thing. And you might completely shift careers. I think we're going to see more and more people constantly potentially shifting in and out of respective careers because the 30-year career that you're going to be able to just do without having to learn anything new will, for the most part, be gone. And so it is like, get curious, get comfortable with the unknown, and just to Eski's point, be ready to learn. So I, I would like to add to that in terms of foundational skills that we find are really important within our company and the work that we do is to expose yourself to data science. Um, these are, you know, particularly important, I think, for um, college age kids who are in school right now. I was really interested to learn that Wharton, um, where I had the pleasure of studying marketing at when I was in school, is now shifting from being a finance driven institution to a data science institution. And I think that that is a reflection of the importance of data and where we're headed. So to expose yourself to data science, um, to expose yourself to a computer science class. And and lastly, uh, I can't underscore how important it is that uh, you really become proficient in public writing and in public speaking. And I think that's incredibly important because as a technician, uh, as a data scientist, or as a business leader, the ability to communicate the work that you're doing effectively to large groups, whether it's like in a panel like this or in a larger forum or within your corporation or within your group, is a skill set that I think is particularly well tailored for human beings and not easily replaced by a robot. And um, there remains, I think, a lot of work that needs to be done in that area because you need to really partner with the individuals that are in the technology sector to be able to evaluate their work and really assess its business implications and how it can be translated into a business model and communicate that out in the marketplace. And um, that requires knowing a little bit of everything and feeling comfortable with public speaking. I also wanted to add that I think it's really important that as higher learning institutions really look at the future, that they not only um, are going to be examining how they're teaching kids, whether it's remotely and in person, but also the way they teach. Kids are really focused on getting grades. And if we continue being very grade focused, I believe that the workforce is going to be challenged in the future because what we know is that curiosity is key. You have to be really interested, engaged, problem-focused in order to keep innovating. And if you ask someone who has spent 12 years doing nothing but memorizing things so that they can get an A, to then really put on that mindset, it's very difficult because it's not being reinforced in school. So I would challenge institutions to really take a look at how they're rewarding students for their learning and whether or not that's really a good fit with the talents that we're going to need down the road. And another area is within corporations or companies. And I really feel that companies need to start treating employees as intellectual property and stop putting them Um, kind of in these boxes, like you do X, you do Y, and together we make, you know, Z. And really understanding that people have have contributions they can make to a lot of different aspects of a company, but they're never asked. Uh, 
And I think it's really important to mine that group intelligence that that companies have and, uh, you know, never really will ask, you know, an, an assistant or ask a junior manager or ask a director about things that are outside of their areas of specialty. And I think that if you really want a company that's going to be progressive and that is going to be addressing innovative problems, it's important to really um, utilize all the intellectual power you have under your roof, so to speak. And I don't see that that's really done very often. It is done in, I think, the entrepreneurial and startup ecosystem because you have to. You only have limited number of people and you have to maximize your growth. But in corporations, I feel people get very siloed. And that's one of the reasons I think you have innovation stagnation. A lot of the times the conversations are really more corporate based and you know university based but there is an entire segment of society that really should consider trade schools and the jobs of the future that involve more of that so while i agree absolutely i think everyone should understand data i think like there is also this need that we need to start propelling that we have a shortage of welders for example like if you love working with your hands we need welders because those robots are going to need servicing um there's a lot of careers out there across the board. It's not just that it has to be in a corporation or what we would normally say are like white collar jobs, but like the blue collar jobs are about to get exponentially better paid is what the research is also saying, while still giving you that freedom to work with your hands and to like leverage those skills. So I think there is also this conversation there of just being open because if you like to work with your hands, like artificial intelligence is about to make so many possibilities for you that are going to pay you finally a much better wage with better benefits than what traditionally has been the case. Thank you both for that. We, you definitely bring up a good point around the role of education in how we train these uh, future wor- workers to uh, adapt into an ever-changing workplace. Um, I think we'll have to leave it at at that, although I think we can uh, definitely continue, but it's time to address some of the audience questions. Um, In closing, I want to thank uh, the panel of experts for the conversation. Thank you so much uh, for your insights. We had a great opportunity to discuss how AI is changing the workplace, uh, some of the ethical uh, considerations around how AI is built, Um, the need for advanced skills. I think we can all agree that getting ready for the future of work requires a better understanding of uh, the leader's uh, ability to lead, of the employer's uh, ability to engage and be more successful in this new world. Um, Also that, you know, across uh, equity, governance, uh, creating uh, opportunities, um, I want to close with uh, a quote from uh, the CTO from Bank of America in her Davos chat, where she said that it isn't uh, what we let AI do to the workforce, it's how we control its use to the good of the workforce. So I think we have probably uh, touched on this during our conversation. The effect of AI on jobs is uh, absolutely within our con- control. And um, I think there is a brave new world out there that we're all co-creating and co-editing as we go. So with that, I want to thank our panel, Mitra, SK, Fernanda, and Nina for uh, your wonderful insights. And uh, we'll go ahead and take questions for the audience. Thank you so much, Eve. That was an amazing discussion. And thank you all for engaging in the chat feature uh, on YouTube. Um, again, if you've gotten some value out of this, please give a thumbs up, uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, but right now we're gonna get into some questions. And so uh, first up is SK. SK. Um, so a question that came from the chat was, how can AI enhance people's capabilities and enable new jobs? Will soft skills be needed in the era of automation? And how can AI support job recruitment? So basically in, in manufacturing, what happens is that a lot of physical work is being going to be automated. So robots are going to do the welding. Robots are going to do uh, sanding, polishing, these type of tasks. 
But historically, manufacturing has been largely about mass production. The same thing get made and everybody gets the same thing. If you talk about any kind of customization or personalization, that's too expensive. So what happens is that once robot can do things automatically and do the physical work, then we can make personalization and customization affordable. So now it opens up an opportunity where humans can start interacting with other humans, figure it out what humans want, and start tailoring products for that. And then you, you can then offer people a affordable personalization. Also, you can optimize your manufacturing operations. So humans can play a big role. And since humans have to start interacting with humans, so obviously people have to master social, you know, much better social skills and also how to interact effectively with humans. So I think AI will make people more capable and they'll be able to do much more creative things. And then it creates new business opportunities. That's how I see it. That's great. Um, next question is coming from the live chat as well. Uh, this is for Fernanda. Uh, will the pandemic accelerate automation to reduce production? Um, okay. Yes, I think it definitely will have a big impact. As we've seen in education, for example, teachers and schools across the nation have had to completely redo their entire lesson plan as, um, as a unique plan to communicate um, you know, via Zoom. And kids have had to learn to sit in front of a computer for six hours um, and uh, try to stay up on their um, on their education. And as we've seen also in business, you know, we do this all day long now. And I think as we grow um, and develop uh, going forward and look for new ways to actually be efficient and productive and to minimize human contact during the pandemic, we're probably going to find that some of the benefits of this virtual um, interaction will stay with us. And that means that you know people may have the opportunity to work from home part-time, um, kids may augment their education with virtual classes as well as in-person classes. Um, and you know even the way that we now grocery shop um, and um, kind of do our own personal inventory management in our home has radically shifted. So I think there's going to be more and more um, digital transformation that comes out of the pandemic for sure. Amazing. Um, our next question will be uh, for Nina. What technologies do you think will gain more traction now that information workers are working from home? So I think we're going to keep seeing uh, this trend towards a human touch. So like we became so used to, especially in corporate America, of going and having email or getting on the phone. And so I do think it'll be voice, but then we're going to see video being a more common, commonly used thing, which I think is great because we had become, prior to COVID-19, very disconnected with how we were communicating with each other. So we're going to see the shift towards humanizing technology as much as possible. And so aside from voice, video, I think VR is another area that we're going to see emerging. Um, pr like prior to the pandemic, it was already being used for learning and also for training. So I think you're going to see that continue and then new expansions into VR so that we can at least always feel more connected. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is really incorporating that human touch more and more into our everyday and trying to cut back uh, never having a one-on-one -on -one interaction with somebody and just using machines. Fantastic. So Mitra, given that we're living right now in seriously a global, uh, sorry, in a depression and global unemployment rate is through the roof. Um, do you see AI replacing more jobs and which jobs do you believe are gonna become non-existent in the near future? And do you have any suggestions, any recommendations for our audience about what to do next? Like how, you know, as we talk about continued learning, uh, what's, the, what's the best way we, people can be focusing uh, their time? And so love to hear your opinion on how AI is replacing jobs and what we can do to kind of get ahead of all this. I do agree that AI will replace jobs. It will replace certain jobs. And some of those, um, Fernanda talked about, some of them SK talked about. And we've seen this pandemic 
really accelerate unemployment and disrupt sort of um, the, the job market in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. What I do believe is that AI will also fundamentally change the nature of work and the nature of our jobs. And therefore, I think new skills will need to be introduced. If it were up to me, I would attach um, a reskilling requirement with every unemployment check. Think about it. Let's make, let's make lemonade. We're in this place now where we have 30 plus million people unemployed. What better time to have a program that reskills people to be ready for those jobs that are already here? We have a, a million jobs that are unfilled because we don't have the right skills to fill them. And yet we have 30 million people unemployed. So I think it's a really interesting time to think about, as organizations think about investing in AI because they see the success of their organization now tied to advanced technologies, it's a really great time for people to reskill in skills that we need today, not even in three years. But think about cybersecurity. I mean, I think one of the comments in the chat was around, yes, if we replace um, you know, humans with robots, and they don't get the human virus, but they get the cyber virus, what are we gonna do then? So cybersecurity is a huge problem that needs, has a huge shortage of talent. That would be a great field for people to get into. Um, I think just regular um, coding, just learning how to code should be, um, is going to be equivalent um, to being literate today in, in, in five to 10 years, if everybody should know how to code. And uh, so I think we need to take advantage of this time and make lemonade because we have no other choice. Very well said. Thank you so much, Mitra. And thank you all to the to all the questions and all the people still engaging inside the chat feature right now. Um, again, this was, um, you know, we, one, make sure the show went on. Uh, we normally do these show uh, these events at Google's campus, but given the circumstances right, we're here now. And um, I feel like it's a really great opportunity for us to get to uh, really share our uh, share discussion to a broader audience and uh, really try to give back. Again, here at AILA, we're all about uh, really you know lifelong learning and always question the status quo. And so if you found some value, please give a thumbs up on the video. Please subscribe. We actually also host a, a regular event every week called The New Normal, which is actually a discussion series. And so if you like this and you actually want to get more involved, uh, every Thursday at noon uh, on Zoom, we have a 10-minute talk, which then leads into 20 minutes worth of breakout discussions where you're going to debate and discuss the topic of, uh, of the day. And uh, it's a great way to meet new people, stay engaged. And uh, again, that happens every Thursday on, uh, on Zoom, and we repost on YouTube. So please subscribe. Uh, please go to joinai.la to learn more about our organization. Uh, donate uh, through Venmo, AI-LA. Uh, there's a PayPal link in the comment section. Again, we're in this all together, and we're just here to, you know, again, provide a, uh, a great platform for all of you to learn more and get ahead of, uh, of this uh, pandemic that we're living through right now. And so again, I would love to thank uh, Eve Salty uh, from Google for moderating an amazing uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you all to our speakers, Mitra, SK, Fernanda, and Nina. Um, I hope to see you all very soon. Um, but again, uh, I think we're gonna close it out right now. Thank you all again for uh, showing up. We had over a thousand uh, people watching our video and uh, we hope to see you again very soon. And so until next time, be safe, be well, be happy. Thank you.